I know. By the way, again, another question. I forgot. In these seminars, is there a break? Should I aim for a break? Yes, yes, so when? Five minutes break after one hour. After one hour. Okay. Good. Yeah, about one hour. Okay. Never okay. 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 Yeah. So I'll try to aim for a natural stop. Okay. Um, good. So I call the talk updates on the Lipschitz extension problem. Um, I'm intending this, or at least the goal initially, is some sort of tutorial to show you some um, ideas and concepts and in my opinion, some great open questions. And I, I try to choose those that I think are doable, whatever that means. Of course, I don't know how to do them. Um, however, the reason I chose this topic is that there is some very more recent progress, which is exciting, and I'm gonna be tempted to jump ahead to new things. So I'm really asking the audience, stop me if you wanna hear more about the classical, because it's very easy to be tempted to jump to new things. Um, and I have no problem just you know showing something older because you want to learn. I, mean, I, I hear I meet with I live with Prince and we're going to have lunch afterwards. I'm, I'm happy to talk about uh, other things. So, but uh, yeah, I will. I, I might be tempted. It's a natural. So yes. So so please stop me if you feel like I'm jumping too fast or something. Um, okay. Now this is a, a huge area. It's a hundred years of mathematics. There are books about it. There is no way to present everything. Not even in a whole year course. I'm gonna, so this is some sort of selection. There are some theorems here, which easily take a few months in a course to teach. And there's, there's a lot of very interesting uh, ideas. So it's just a taste. Again, my goal is to tempt you and um, maybe uh, solve some of these questions. So here is, a, so the basic concept. So um, again, not the most general um, and we'll get to that, but so we're gonna associate, so we have a metric space. Um, X is symmetric D. If there would be more than one metric, I'll use it as a sub as a, as a, as an index. Sometimes I'll just write D. Um, so it's a metric space. And we associate with just a number, which is an invariant. It's a big Lipschitz invariant. So um, the Lipschitz extension modulus. X, well, it depends on the metric, and we will talk about it. Sometimes I would highlight the metric, but um, it will be important later, um, which I call E of X. It's a, it's a number, it's a, not a, it can be infinity, usually it's infinity. Um, um, it's a, the infimum, so the smallest of the infimum. L such that for every subset and then also for every bun of space. I'll say a word about this in a second. Y. So it's a norm space. It's a norm. I'm quantifying it over everything. Um, and then for every a one Lipschitz function, function f in the subset of a bundle space. Exists a function f, which is defined everywhere, an x, with some y, um, that extends f and it's Lipschitz constant, so we'll denote Lipschitz constant by the Lipschitz norm. Is it most so L? So I, there's a lot of for every series of so, Having this number be at most 10 or some constant is a power, because there is so many quantifiers, is a powerful thing. So again, so the picture is you have your x, you have, and then you take an arbitrary target space. So I, well, I do it like that, but I, I wrote minus space, so let me. 
this is why an arbitrary subset can be as crazy as you want. So X can be our N with some norm and the subset A can be some Julia set or something, you know, or a discrete subset. We have a function F going in here. You want to extend it to find a function which is defined globally in all of X, um, um, coincides with F on the subset A. And the Lipschitz condition, just so if the condition, if we knew that is it most dx y? Okay, I'll probably stop with the stop with the indices at some point. So this is given, and we want capital F to be as smooth as possible in this sense. So. So the question is, is, is so say, if I tell you here is a space whose modulus is at most 100, I'm saying something very strong. I'm saying, give me any subset of X as crazy as you wish, any Banach space is complicated norm as crazy as you want. And the function can al is always actually a restriction. If it's one Lipschitz, it's a restriction of something which is 100 Lipschitz. Okay, is the definition clear? Um, you should expect most of the time this number to be infinity in the sense that this is just not possible. There exists a bad subset and a bad Lipschitz function which cannot be extended. Um, I want to say, so one word about the fact that I wrote Banach, uh, Banach that why is the Banach space. This uh, will, and of course, <laughs> later in the talk, we'll, we'll, um, we'll discuss general space. So obviously, um, you can ask a question for any metric space in the target here. And and um, so the, so what, what so I chose Banach space just for the sake of this is how the classical theory in the beginning of the 1930s etc. This is what people looked at, um, but we're not ignoring other metric spaces. So when you look at the papers, you're going to see what happens when y is a manifold with certain curvature bounds, maybe some groups. There are many 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 situations where the y is not a Banach space. It's not that mathematicians are ignoring this case. But this is just a, the classical case, and in for in for in many um, well in, in in the most common generalization to uh, to more general say non positively curved manifolds, it turns out that the hardest case is the Banach space. But 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 for now, this is really hard enough and uh, and, and and rich enough so we can uh, think about Banach spaces. But it's not that I care only about Banach spaces or other people in the literature. So. Okay, so that's a different. Um, so if, if you just put the target to be just any metric space, does it trivialize and it becomes always mostly infinity, like unless it's finite or something silly, <laughs> or is it also not? not <laughs> okay, so okay, so this is again, this is a I forget my category theory, but this is a projective or injective. When you have the quantifier for every banner space, this becomes this is a diagram completion problem, right? You have, you have x. If you subset A, if you have a completely general Y, this is the F, this is inclusion. In fact, you can always complete this diagram. If you have any Y, this is equivalent. There, then there's all kinds of just abstract uh, ways to. Uh, so it's equivalent to saying, so if you can always extend F, it's equivalent to saying that there is a retraction, an L Lipschitz retraction, L. Capital L retraction from the superspace onto A. A retraction means a mapping from the superspace going back down to the subset A. It's L Lipschitz and it's the identity on A. Why is equivalent? You can take Y to be A itself and take little F to be the identity mapping. Okay, and then and then this is just a definition. This is what a retraction is. A retraction is nothing more than an extension of the identity mapping from A to itself. Right, but then if you have a retraction, then you obviously can extend. You just take your a point here, project it down to here, and come in with using this retraction. So when I, so I, this is the same thing as you can always collapse x onto the subset a. That's a very very interesting question. When can you do? And when you can? When you can't? Um, but that's what it amounts to. It's some sort of um, a projection problem. 
Right, right, right. Okay, so definitely interesting. But I imagine that it becomes very general in the sense that because you also quantify over every so, day, Yeah, so probably... that's impossible. So let's say if X is connected in A is two points, you're done. But if it, if it has to be a, a continue, forget about Lipschitz, a continuous image of X, then you cannot take, very often we want to take some, we have a continuous object and we have something defined in a discrete object. That's uh -huh. a lot of the applications. In that case, you're done already. Okay, um, so you cannot take something connecting onto something. This is going to get completely regardless of the fact that it's Lipschitz. And those of you who remember your points of topology for undergrad, in the continuous world, this has been studied by the Tietze extension theorem. There's, um, so there are issues with connectivity. Um, um, yeah, okay, so, uh, and, and we will see the, um, variations of, we will, these questions have actually, in two minutes probably, or a few minutes, I will explain what the dual formulation of this question is, and then you will see that this is relating to the retraction problem, except that you relax what retraction really means. But let me get to that then. Like in, it, there, there are books on this, and there is all these equivalences, and, 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 and this is it's essentially any question that you can ask has been asked a long, long time ago. Okay, um, so a lot of them is known. Um, so that is the Lipschitz extension modulus. And by, by Lipschitz invariant, I really mean that if you form the metric, um, this by the way, liberation, then your parameter, your modulus, your distances are deformed by a factor, by Lipschitz, by a factor of a thousand. This grows by close to a thousand, etc. Um, so this is, a, this is a nice invariant of a metric space. I want, um, I really want to talk mostly about this parameter, but there is another thing, another version. So this is, you can think of this as, like the, as an in, internal extension problem. X is the space. And you and, and you and it, you want to extend for every subset of X. There is an external version of it when X is the subspace. So um, so um, the modulus of absolute extendability absolute Lipschitz. Extendability of X. A E of X. Okay, so absolute extendability. Same thing, but now X is the subset. So, um, so okay, so is is we write it is smallest L such that for every superspace. So again, for every bound of space, Y is before. For every maybe metric space, Z which contains X. And for every F is X, Y, there exists F. On the super from defining the super space um, that extends an F as before. And this is the constant. Most you know. okay, so this is again I again I, I don't that this is um, so there is something about X for absolute extensibility. There, there is something so about X which, whenever it sits inside the superspace Y, any sorry, not Z, okay, then there is always it's some, it has some, something with the intrinsic geometry means that if it's sitting in a superspace Y, every Lipschitz function in X is actually a restriction. For something defined globally. So again, you should be um, justifiably um, concerned that this never happens. Okay, and, 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 and related, regarding your question, this is um, the analog of this in the world of retractions. So, so in the, um, there is there is 
if you look at the literature, there's a huge amount of papers about the notion of absolute Lipschitz retracts. So there are spaces which have the property that whenever they sit in a super space, you can always collapse the super space in the Lipschitz way onto it. And if you're interested, there's really a lot of literature and a lot of very nice theorems about this. So, um, so that would happen if I quantify it over, instead of every Banach space, for every, I would just need the X itself to be to be the image. And then I get whenever X is sitting in a super space, you can collapse in a Lipschitz way the super space onto X and keep while keeping all the points in X in depth. So there is a lot of literature on this notion of absolute Lipschitz retracts. There's a question for me. So clarification, whenever we are talking about subsets, subsets we are uh, with the induced metric. metric no yeah. Submetric sub, yeah, subspace with uh, subset with the metric inherited restriction of the metric. So um, I, I want to get to theorems and I'll state a couple of immediately open, open questions, but I define these notions as they are parameters of the given metric space and they involve a ton of quantifiers. There should be an intrinsic way to look at the space itself, not just quantifier every target Banach space, every super space, every subspace, etc. There should be a way to look at the, the geometry of X itself and make it and, and conceivably determine what this number is. So that I'm going to state in a second. So this has to be, this is a property of the space, even though it involved all these quantifiers. Okay, so, um, so now, and, and, and one of the um, um, new things that I'm going to mention in the end is that this dual formulation, this intrinsic formulation, I, I, I was, everybody knew it for decades. Um, it was staring us at us in the face and we couldn't figure out how to work in the dual. We just, we actually used this extension uh, philosophy. Um, and um, I will mention some theorems that come from systematic, finally, I, I, not always, but I can systematically. Okay, let's get to this. Let me state a couple of quite, uh, um, examples of major open questions and what, what, what is known. So for the extendability constant, um, so first of all, so this is paper of Johnson, Strauss, Sheffman, from nineteen eighty six. Brilliant paper. Um, maybe show you a formula or some. some um, something that comes out from the paper later, but they prove that for any any n-dimensional norm space, x to so Rn with some norm, e of x is at most. So whenever I write this, I mean an honest universal constant is a hundred times n or something like that. Okay. Um, so if you have, if you're you're you're, you're in n-dimensional space, you have an arbitrary subset. Um, you can um, you have a function on this subset. You can extend it to a globally defined function, and the Lipschitz constant grew by a factor of n. Um, they use the, those of you. There's again there's like something called the Whitney extension method. Again, something from the 30s. They modified it in a very nice way. Um, they they used his method, but uh, there is a nice modification to get this n. I might say a word about this later. Um, Sorry, so I mentioned here is covering or you're just- Our end, our end with the norm. All of them, nothing is exotic here. Um, And just to quickly indicate how a great open question that has been open for a very long time, and I, I and I think many others have been looking at. So open. So let's call this system a star. And star. Prove. So over the years, I think there are 
two, three genuinely different proofs of this estimate that have been found with several with different people. And they always get stuck at N, but uh, we do not know if you can do any better. It's a great question. Let's continue with the, so again, so again, open. So we'll write an asterisk here and I'll, um, um, evaluate your x for any up to constants. Up to constants, or I'll tell you in a second. Uh, um, for any n dimensional long space. So I'm not asking any n dimensional long space. In particular, um, what is the growth rate of E for Hilbert space? Okay, so we are we are very, very, very there is a, a lot of in investigation, and I'll say a lot. A lot is known. We do not even know what happened. This is not about we actually in for applications, we care about interesting norms and one that shows up, etc. But even so, I don't have um you know off-the-shelf application of the Hilbertian case, but this is Rn. This is Rn, the usual norm. We do not know the growth rate. Um, and when, so open star, that means, and I, I, I hope to get to this at the end, um, so this was open until 2021, and there is a theorem, so there is, I, I could figure it out for one space, so E of L infinity N is bounded above and below, but um, Universal concept multiples of root of n. Okay, so this is the only space. So I don't know if it's for any other LP space. Um, I don't, and so to be fair mathematically, when I say this is the only space for which I computed it, I can artificially cook up spaces for which the proof computed. it. But I, but I mean spaces that we meet in the street. Okay, or, okay so, so for n infinity, the answer is root n. And that is the only space for which we know the answer. Like, unless you artificially go into the proof and force other examples. Are there lower bounds here? Yeah, uh, yes. Okay. So in the same paper, and I, at least I want to explain this um, later. Um, e of x is always at least n to some c where a for every n dimensional of space. I'll, I'll explain what this is so later. So, the, so when I say really, so when I say up to constants, the game here understanding is like understanding the exponent of it. And later when I'll write down formulas for all kinds of shut in spaces, LP spaces, etc., I'd be very happy for computations up to lower order factors as well. But, but there's, the game is there's an upper bound of n, the lower bound is n to some power. Um, and the question is, what is the power of n? So to be concrete for Hilbert space, um, so for Euclidean space, um, so the best known bounds for L to N for L to N E of L to N is at most root of N and at least four through n. Okay, so um, this is due to lean myself back in 203. And this is due to Mendel and myself. I don't remember right now. Um, 2014, something like that, but it, it relies on a brilliant idea built 
and, and, it, and it brings you the overcarriton. Two, two, four. You know, um, so there's a, I, maybe I'll get to this. This is a very, very beautiful proof. Um, so a lower bound means that you cook up some subset of a Hilbert space in a, in a Lipschitz function from it into a Banach space. And you have to argue that there is n every function which coincides with this Lipschitz, it's a one Lipschitz function on the subset. Every function which coincides with this one Lipschitz function on the subset but the is defined globally, must have a Lipschitz constant of at least four through them. Okay, so, um, um, uh, okay, so, Um, but what if this same um, enter the C constant here? So um, I, I should say something about lower bound. So this was something that uh, um, this um, that uh, so um, right. So, okay, um, maybe two words about a, a, a lot of the methods, not all, but a lot of the theorems in this area come from an analogy from the linear theory. So what would be the analog in the linear theory, in the Banach space world? In the Banach space world, the analog of this question is the following. Now X is a Banach space. The subset A is a subspace. There's a, a Y in the Banach space. Now we think a linear operator, a linear operator, and you want to say that T is a restriction can be extended to a linear operator such that hopefully small constant times, sorry, the operator. Model. So now in this question, okay, for example, when Y is R, this is the Hanbana theorem. Okay, but this question is extremely well studied in analysis. Um, and um, so, and, and, a, and a lot of the theorems, which again, I would not uh, uh, go into proofs, a lot of the theorems come from an analogy with the linear theory. There is something called the Ribe program, which motivates some translation between linear and nonlinear. So a lot of the methods, if you go to the literature, you'll hear things like Markov type, et cetera. This comes from things that have been developed in the linear theory. Okay. Um, there is one situation where this extension problem in the linear world has a trivial solution, a fundamental, but a trivial solution. And that is when X itself is a Hilbert space. Because this is exactly your question about retractions. When you have a Hilbert space, and a, well, a closed, I should have said closed, but a closed subspace, a linear subspace of a Hilbert space, there is always a norm one projection. A norm one projection is precisely a retraction. Okay, so how would you extend the linear operator defined in the subspace of a Hilbert space globally? You would first project, take the orthogonal projection onto the subspace, and then apply T. Okay, so all of these, these questions are completely trivial in the Hilbert space world. Trivial. Okay. A module of this fact that there is always a projection, and we're going to get to that. Okay. However, already here, I'm telling you, or here I'm telling you for every space, that this is even for a Hilbert space. This analogy with the linear world breaks down, right? Because in a Hilbert space, you can always extend and lose nothing in the Lipschitz constant if you're trying to extend linear mappings on closed subspaces. Here, I'm telling you, there's a Lipschitz function that was one Lipschitz on the subspace, and it's it's awful. I mean, it's, it, 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 um, any Lipschitz function which coincides with it must be must have a huge Lipschitz constant. So, um, so this was open actually for many years. Um, so. The question of let me maybe I'll reorder my talk and I'll, I'll explain the proof of that theorem. Um, I plan to do it later, but uh, okay, I'm, I'm just going along. Um, um, so, so this was this was a question um, by in the same paper.
was is L2 finite or infinite. Okay, so the, the finiteness would correspond to complete analogy with what, with what happens for linear mappings because of the projection. Um, and actually, the, this was reiterated by many people. Eventually, in 1992, Keith Ball, in a very influential paper, conjectured that this is infinite. So he somehow already had this feeling um, that um, uh, that's a lot of brilliant intuitions were in that paper, but he had this feeling that something worse is happening. So this is something that I did. Um, so, so this is something that I did in my dissertation a long time ago. Um, that e of L two is infinite. So there, and and moreover, when you analyze the proof, it's, so where C is a constant. Okay, so um, this gives this result um, for um, for um, when X is in the frame, the Euclidean space. Um, this is a better power than the, the, what that gives. Okay, and it had other features which I, uh, were very important. For, uh, but in terms of of, of, um, of the statement, this was already done uh, here. So um, how do you pass from the lower bound for a Hilbert space, from a Hilbert space, from a lower bound for a Hilbert space to any space whatsoever? So this is something I wanna uh, show you this. There is a nice question here, which uh, I, you know, computer science uh, discrete math seminar, I think this is a question which I think should be solved. Um, So I'm, I'm skipping ahead to something I plan to explain later. And then I want to discuss also absolute extendability, et cetera. But let me show you what goes into the machinery here and ask an open question that shows up from the proof, okay? So, um, so, so this is just notation. Um, so if X is, a, X is a norm space, one of space. Um, dx is its distance, if you want my digits, to a Hilbert space. That's how it will show up in the proof, but it's, it re easily reduces to. Uh, so, that by that I mean x is some norm on it. So, it's, it's dx is the smallest. So, dx is the smallest. D such that there exists a, a, Hilbert, a Hilbertian norm. The same vector space x such that uh, it's dominated. Okay, so in our end, it just means if you draw the unit ball of x, you want to put an ellipsoid inside, inside or outside. Uh, This is outside, so let me right. Yeah. So you want to put an ellipsoid inside, and ellipsoid is just a unit ball of angular version norm. So that if you multiply the ellipsoid by D, this is this is the ellipsoid, this is D times the ellipsoid multiply every vector by D it swallows the unit ball. Okay, that's the best approximation by an ellipsoid, that's the X. And I actually, I, I wrote my leaflets, you can, it, here it's the linear, but, uh, but we can reduce one to the other, it's the same question. So, so we know, um, that, um, that, um, EX is at least, 
and with a C divided by dx. That's a theorem from 201 that I told you, because in, for Hilbert space, the lower bound is some end to some universal constant. It's behind here, or I erased it. And this is a Bailey's invariant. So, um, so if uh, if I distort the norm, the smallest d is that uh, is this d of x, then I get that lower bound. So this, this is just the same theorem. Okay? This theorem is the case when the x is equals one, when it's one follows from the other the invariance. Bailey's invariance is that clear? So that's what we have to work with. Okay, so, so now comes in something which is a huge result from the 70s. Um, and it's amazing that what I'm going to say now has great open questions associated to it. Okay, so this is, I don't know if um, this is called the Linde Schaus Safiri theorem. Seventy-one, also known as the solution of a very substance problem. That is very complemented substance problem. Um, I think less than um, I, I've seen this. I think, uh, <laughs> Relative to your miniatures, shown that when you, the, the, this is the, the, the only math entry that I ever read in Encyclopedia Britannica. This was at the time of big deal, so you can look at the uh, complemented subspace problem. And it has the following. Um, so we, I said a moment ago, remember a moment ago, that Hilbert space has the property that whenever you take a closed subspace, there is a projection of norm, norm one, but in particular bounded from the superspace onto the subspace. And Banach asked, and they saw is, is there, does this characterize Hilbert space? Okay, so suppose I give you a norm space with the property that whenever you have a closed subspace inside, you can collapse then, you can project by a bounded operator the whole superspace onto the subspace. And, that, and so the, the, uh, the theorem says that uh, so x is a bound of space. If every, if for every, for every um, closed linear subspace, uh, y, there exists a linear operator P from X to Y. It's a projection p squared is p and operator p is finite, then dx is finite. So it's a more of space. It's a beautiful result. Um, absolutely great theorem, and I don't think that I think anybody would be happy to prove. Um, is the statement clear? No, okay. So you can quantify this and just read your proof. Um, so let's, this is something, nobody gave this a name. I gave it in the 201, 2021 paper a name. I call it the LT of X. It's just the, the smallest, the inf. It's an obvious definition. I'm not saying it's a, this is just a name I gave it, but it's obvious. So, uh, LT is the infimum over K such that the situation is over there. So for, it's such that for every y in x, there exists p from x to y, such that p squared is p, and the link shows a theory constant. The obvious, the, 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 um, some people call it the internal projection constant. It's, so the, the, that's the, um, the, the obvious, the, uh, 
That's what your proof gives. Maybe not actually. It could be it's an, a, with an asterisk here, um, double asterisk. I don't mean double word, but, but that's d of x is less than a t of x squared. Okay, so that, that's what the proof really gives. Okay, uh, no, I don't think that's we say that there are two s, yeah. But the assumption here does not assume that LT is finite, right? So because there's first there's a bound there is a, a first step showing that ah, okay. if, if, if there is a projection, then then actually there is a uniform bound of the projection. This is a okay. uniform boundedness principle. This goes in. You have to prove that. But but it's interesting in its own right. And, uh, you can do, you can also ask about this formulation of the problem. Yeah. If uh, that's it's equivalent to the original question, but we don't need to know that for the purpose of this talk. Okay. Um. But but it is equivalent. Um, so double asterisk. Um, so the first one, I'm not sure I'm being recorded. So I, I simply, this is, it was my advisor. I don't remember if they got a square, maybe they got a cube. Then there was a later paper with Yagin that, um, okay, there's, it could be the square, which is the best known bound today, um, is not from the original paper. So I'm, I'm sorry if it's, uh, you know, I just simply, I, it, I, I think there was a later paper which got the square, um, but I'm not 100% sure, certain. Um, the more substantial that, so that's the first, I'm not I know I'm talking about Banach space, but I'm not talking about the double rule. The, 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 the second one is actually, you know, a, it's mysterious, but when you read the proof, it's not, it, it's not mysterious. This, um, this second works only if X is finite, infinite dimensional. So their proof really uses infinite dimensions. There is some um, infinite argument. And because the whole theorem is obvious when it is finite dimensional, everything, all the norms in RN are equivalent to each other. So there's nothing, so that's how they open. They say all the norms in RN are equivalent. We can assume without loss of general that X is infinite dimensional. And then they, and, and the proof really uses infinite dimensions. So, um, but in, the, in this context, this, right, well, we're talking about the world we live in, which is discrete math, computer science, we care about finite dimensions. So this version of the question makes sense in finite dimensions. Okay, so the question, what can you bound D of X by LT of X makes perfect sense in finite dimensions. Um, and, and the proof really, really didn't work. Okay, so this was open for a while. If you can do that, and this was solved, so, um, the, you know, famous paper on Voretsky's theorem, Finger Linden Strauss. Nineteen seventy-seven proved that this V of X is less than L T of X. I don't remember some big number here, like maybe I'll say twenty-six, maybe thirty-six, maybe fifty, some some big exponent. Um, I don't remember, so let's say big old one. Okay, so using a completely different proof. Um, so this is all very, very beautiful things, um, which I recommend reading. Um, okay, um, and um, so, but the best known bound, so best known bound, is a theorem of Tom Chuck. It's in, it appeared only in a book, in her book, uh, Tom Chuck Yeagerman, very clever, uh, 1989. She proved that V of X is less than LT of X power five. Okay, so I recommend reading this just because it will force you to, to learn essentially all of the local theory of Banach because it really uses everything that was known at the time. A lot of very, very nice mathematics goes into this. Um, um, so the obvious open question is, can you get the square there? And this is still, we still don't know the answer. But what he says is that if you have an n-dimensional, any, okay, any space, but let's say you have a, the, the, the novelty here is for finite dimensions. Um, 
you have a finite dimensional space and whenever you look at the subspace, you can find the projection in a, a, a matrix P such as P squared equals P on, and takes values in the subspace of norm at most K, then actually there is an ellipsoid which approximates the unit ball up to K to the power five. Okay, so it's a great question. Can this be improved? So as I said, of course, here is D max is finite, but of course the bounds don't depend on the dimension. So this is interesting for us. Can this be to P of X less than P of X squared? I love this question. Um, I'll say something about this later. I'll give, I'll give a proposed way to prove it, um, but they, they don't know how to do it yet, but I, but I think there's a good chance. Um, just to be, this again, this is a very high profile results, but to the best of my knowledge, um, and again, I looked yesterday, but uh, I, I don't think anything changed since the early 70s. We do not know if this can be the change to linear. So there's no lower bound bigger than a linear. So there's many, many, many papers, many, the bunch of papers that study this theory and proved it in various ways, cared about the constant in front here. But I don't, to the best of my knowledge, and again, for those who are nine, if somebody knows, I'd be happy to know. Um, we do not know if it has, it, 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 conceivably, we don't even need the square. But in, in there, at this initial stage, the, we find a proof which gives the best known bound and doesn't go through case one, it's infinite dimensional, case two, it's finite dimensional, just gets the best known bound. Maybe the square the fact is, is sharp. I, I have in certain intuitions which might, they're not, they're meta mathematics. Um, but it's a very nice question about just our end. Um, Okay, so why am I saying all of this? So let's go back to the theorem. I want to justify the theorem here. Um, um, and I really come from the world of, of retractions, this analogy to the linear world. And I, and I say the following. Um, so, okay, so in, in 1964, this is, this is really a, a very important paper that started a lot of this connection between linear and linear. It, um, this is a seminal paper in the field of linear trials from 1964. I highly recommend reading it. It's simply a beautiful mathematics and introduced an entire field. What he proved, and I'll say it in words, is that if you have a reasonable Banach space, in particular finite dimension, okay, uh, but a reasonable Banach space, and you have a subspace of it, if there is a Lipschitz retraction onto the subspace, and there's also a projection onto the subspace. So, in the not, so there is a reduction from nonlinear to linear, right, or linear to nonlinear. I never know. <laughs> but if there is a way to nonlinearly take the superspace in a 100 Lipschitz way, and Project and, and project it down to the subspace in such a that identity mapping on the subspace, then you can also do it using a linear mapping and the norm and the norm doesn't change, it's still 100. Okay. Um, so, we, so this is again a very nice, one of the many results in this paper. Um, um, but that means, by, again, I didn't write it, but I said it, that means that uh, E of X is, at least LT, sorry, it's at least LT, sorry, it's, it's always actually like this, LT of X. This is what this means. It's okay, right? If um, take a subspace, which is the worst possible norm of a projection onto it, okay? And now consider the Lipschitz function, which is the identity mapping from the subspace to itself. There is no way to extend the identity mapping. It's the same as saying every projection has norm at least LT of X. Okay. But if you could extend it in a Lipschitz way, then by this uh, rigidity theorem of Lindenstrauss from the 60s, you could also, if you extend it to an, to an whatever this number is, 100, to a 100 Lipschitz function, then you would also have had a, an, a linear extension, which is extension of the identity mapping is the same thing as a projection. So I said it in words. Is, does everybody agree? So this is just, this is what he proved really, okay? 
is there is a theorem happening here, a nice theorem happening here, which was used in many other, other concept, contexts, but this is what it, it, it proved. And now if you use Tomchek, so we actually know that E of X is bigger than the maximum of That means that there is a this enter some concept. So in one case, you take the counter example, let's say from my paper from 201, which gave that, and but distorted with whatever the best distortion to a Hilbert space is. And in the other case, if you're very, very far from a Hilbert space, then by this big linear results and the reduction to linear, there must exist a subspace for which there is no projection and therefore no extension of the identity mapping. And one of the two together always costs you into some universal concept. So that's why this is the game that we're uh, in. But we don't, so it's, it's about the constant. Um, I wanna say, so I cared about the constant. I should say uh, the, here, I cared about the constant in that proof. And then, so I was kind of, Intrigued by this power five, etc. I um, you can um, so here is what I proved for the purpose. That I was that I mean that is for the purpose of improving the constant. It's not but it's not crucial for the paper. But I, so I do know something close to this. I know that uh, if dimension of x is a, then um, E of X is at most L T of X, sorry, of X squared, but I got some probably with log and cube or something like that. Okay, so if you actually plug this, then you get a better bound an exponent of two. Um, then it's better because you only lost a log. But, and so this tells me that this should be true. Okay. Um, um, so you know we have two logarithms, and so the game is getting rid of this final logarithm. As stated, this does not imply the, the, the solution of the, I erase it, this, the, the linear short theory theorem, because there's a dependence on dimension. So getting rid of the log is not just um, for fun, it will be a different proof uh, of um, this classical work, okay? So, so let me tell you what I, so if you read the paper, Here's a con concrete conjecture. It's called the two-parameter version of Elton's theorem. This is a phenomenon, a beautiful phenomenon that Telegram found in the early 90s. So this is about improving it. Let me tell you exactly. So here's a conjecture. I don't know if I conjectured it. Maybe I wrote it as a question. Let's, let's make a conjecture. Um, um, So, uh, so you are given some delta, one, maybe a half, so I won't. And then um, in some dimension, um, x is not a dimension, another, and x is a Banach space. And x1 up to xn are unit vectors. Such that if you sum up so um, the vectors with coefficients, and you take the expectation, that's at least delta times n, where g1 up to gn are identity functions. Okay, so the upper bound of n is just the triangle inequality, right? You just, uh, it is, I'm assuming it's a unit vector. They can reverse the triangle inequality.
and the conjecture is then then there are um, s and t two numbers between zero and one. Such that, first of all, they're related by t. There is a reason for this. So, t times root s is at least delta, the, 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 the delta here. Okay. And two, there is a subset in the indices. Um, with at least. S times n elements, so you can have a subset of these indices such that um, if you sum aj x j only on the subset and you compute the norm, that's at least t times the sum of aj. This is for everyone. So again, the, the, the reverse inequality is a triangle inequality. So what this says is that if you got an equal, in, you reverse the triangle inequality on average, then you would get a big subset where the norm is actually in L1 norm up to this factor of a one word in this norm normalization. The upper bound is sum of a like absolute value, again, triangle inequality, but it's reversed. Okay, so those of you who know this, um, this is a, the fact that you can do this for some S and T which depend on delta is an important theorem of Elton from the 70s. Um, and this idea of, but that's when you insist that the subset is itself of size some function of delta times n, and the distortion is a function of delta. And what Talagrand discovered in 1992 is that sometimes you can get, you can get a lot of mileage from not insisting that the subset is big and that distortion is big, just delta is, is a function of delta, but you don't, you, you say they're just related to each other in a certain way. So if the subset is very, very small, then that you get a better distortion. If the distortion is very big, you get a bigger subset. And, and in my proof, I really need these two parameter version. Okay, so this is a very nice question. Um, it's related to questions in learning theory and, and empirical processes. Um, the, be the best known bound that I was very surprised that, uh, and I confirmed with the authors. So these are very high profile papers. Um, so Talagrand proved this, um, but it, um, so, okay, so, sorry, that's it. So, uh, so he proved it, uh, uh, let me tell you the best known bound. So it's a paper of, in analyst papers of Rudelson and Bershinen, of Rudelson. Two o six, a deep and beautiful paper where they get this with t times root s at least delta, but they have a logarithmic term. One over delta. And they have some power three over two. That's how we got the, the power three. Yeah, okay, it got squared. Um, so we almost know this. Um, Telegram put this with some big constants. Um, and this was, there are, there, these are big results with lots of applications. And I, then I started asking around, did any, does anybody have an example showing that the log is needed? And so to my knowledge, again, of being recorded, there is no counterexample. So conceivably, there is this optimal version of the theorem. That would be interesting, I think, regardless. It's a nice fact in probability from random to deterministic, finding the subset selection problem. There's a lot of things which go into this entropy of empirical processes. So first of all, maybe it's true. And if it's true, that was the only reason for the logarithm. That would finish this, this classical thing. This would give would get rid of any dependence. The minute you, re, you get the constant times delta, you would get rid of the log and you prove this thing, which would be a, a genuinely different proof of the initial of So I think um, 
that would be that's a nice thing um, to do. I don't know how to do it, but it's I, I have a feeling it's doable. Maybe finding a counterexample showing that some that you cannot do linearly. Um, but that would also be worthwhile because these are uh, so the, I'm I, so now I want to so let me just say um, I want yeah of course I'm much slower than normal but uh, I'm here so now it's 11:30 so I'm one hour into this I can stop now and discuss absolute extendability and then some proofs and in, in the dual formulation yeah but then it means that uh, I will do less if we take a break so it mainly depends on you guys if you want a break I'm happy you want to do you need a five minute break. You're allowed to say, actually, you know what? Actually, I've been in the audience before. We're taking a five minute break, okay? So, <laughs> so clearly, I'm going to do much less than I planned, but that's life. I, I hope that's what we have. Okay, um, I'm not going anywhere. Um, okay, let me say a few words about absolute extendability. I, I not, rather, I, I, I more want to focus on this in, um, downward version of the parameter, but they're both uh, interesting. So I'm going to say what's known about absolute extendability, and then I'm going to show what the dual formulation, what the intrinsic formulation is, and then try to prove some things. We'll see. Okay. Um, um, so for absolute, so um, the best known bounds. So first of all, maybe. Um, so there are uh, lots of spaces for which this a. Remember, so remember a a e of x um, was. Now you think of x, it's the smallest L, such that whenever you have a Lipschitz function from x into L, but x is actually a subset of an arbitrary superspace with the metric inherited from the superspace, then, it, then you can actually extend um, the function to an L Lipschitz function. So it's completely not obvious that there are spaces for which this number is even finite. Um, um, but, well, you know, absolute, absolute Lipschitz retracts. Okay, it's not obvious unless you know the literature. <laughs> but uh, so there are, are such examples. Okay, but uh, a priori you wouldn't. You have to think. Uh, and we'll, actually, uh, we'll work out the, the real line of this property, for example. Um, um, okay, so so in this paper, so really the, again going this paper, which is very um, this Johnson and Sheffman paper, they they prove that. A E of X is a post log N. So if you have endpoints in a metric space, then you, the Lipschitz constant grows by log N. So that's a. Um, and I, I'm, I'm stating this because I want to give, when I'll write the dual, I'll write, I'll write the formula for what, it, what your proof gives in a second. So uh, the extension formula, if you want, in the dual. Um, which I didn't say. But, okay, so but the best known bounds so let's call let's call a e of n to be the soup of a e x when x is an n for a space. So the, that's the asymptotics of the sequence that they care about. There was an analog of the e for n-dimensional spaces. So uh, a e of n is at most log n over log log n. A little bit better than that, but in at least root log n. So again, very very fundamental parameter about endpoint metric spaces, which we do not know what the asymptotics. This is due to Lean Meissner. Three. Two, four, and this is due to Rapani and myself, 2017, something like that. Um, both these, all of these bounds, and I, there's a forthcoming paper, which is it's not, it, it, um, a paper of Mendel and myself. I, we didn't decide what to call it yet. Something like absolute extendability revisited. We prove these bounds in new ways, but, which, but these new ways are coming from. They are new, but they are um, also coming from you know the benefit of hindsight. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a semi-survey, but the proofs there are new proofs which give these formulas, and I'll, I'll, I'll show uh, what these are. But great open question. I would love it to be solved is rate of growth. Of a e. 
we also know that AE is finite for in the same paper we proved for spaces which are doubling. And there's a um, doubling constant and graphs with restricted minors, surfaces of bounded genus, if you want. Um, so there are all kinds of classes for where, where we know these. And probably for nothing, we know the correct asymptotics, unless the answer is a constant already in the theorem. Um, so there is a um, yeah, and there and there are again forthcoming words where we show that in some sense we understand this barrier. So we can show that the method of proof which produces something called the gentle partition of unity. I, I might get actually will get to it. Um, so if you want to approach this problem using these gentle partitions of unity, this is a type of partition of unity which with nice properties, randomized partition of unity. Then you have to then we have a lower bound. Rabani, Mendel, and I have a lower bound of log and over log log. And so for at least for the approach. This is the truth. This doesn't mean that there is a different approach. I think we should. Okay, so um, let me um, let me extend the duo. Okay, so so up to now, I, I, I this, these parameters are monstrous, right? They say a metric space. It's a you take the infimum over all subsets of all Banach spaces of all Lipschitz functions. What is this parameter when I look at the space? So it, 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 this is something that is, it has been known for decades. I mean, this is staring at us in the face. It's a simple duality. The first time I've seen it written is in a 205 work of Kuzdoba. But there is a paper of Ambrosio and Kuglisi from 2020, where it, which does this duality systematically. So it's the, this. There are issues which I'm going to put under the rug, like what happens when the spaces are infinite, what is actually measurable, what is the actual space, what is the topology. So you, if you want to, there, is, there are issues which I are studied by in the literature, and I'm not going to talk about them, but if you want to read about this, there is a, very, there is a definitive treatment um, by Ambrosio and Puglisi. Okay, but, but this isn't, no, but in its basic form, it's very, very simple, and let me explain. So, um, so I, this is called, I call this the Wasserstein round problem. Which is a rounding question, which um, this, we should really be using computer science more in my opinion. It's, it's decisive and I'll discuss versions of it. Decisive in mathematics, really. Uh, and I have not seen it a lot in computer science. So I, so, um, so let me just, I'm gonna present the problem and then the statement will be its equivalent to the, to the question. So we're sitting in this row, okay? And we have um, a subset, okay? This is a, this room is R3, okay? The continuous space and the subset is the audience. Okay, or if you want a more complicated subset and we're just gonna look at the hairs of the audience or something, okay? So now I want to round up every point in this space to the hairs on your head. Okay, so what, what do I want? What does that mean? Um, so it's a randomized rounding. So, um, so, you, so we have X is a metric space. And A is a subset of X. And A is the hairs on your head in this particular case. And X is R3, okay? So every point, so the goal, So for every point x in the ambient space, um, so every chooses a probability measure u sub x supported on the subset. Every point, let's say this corner of the podium here, decides what it means by a random hair of you, of the audience. Okay? And every point gets to choose. And you want some consistency assumptions. So such that then, uh, these consistency assumptions are with these customers, a, a twist by Borgen from the mid 80s, which is very beautiful, and, and there's again something which is intriguing from the point of view of computer science. But in, in the vanilla version, so you want first of all, if x is an a, ux is delta s. So if 
you are already a hair on your head, then I round myself to myself. Okay. We're actually going to, it's decisively in mathematics and nothing computer science discuss relaxation of weeks later. So, I mean, I think it would be very interesting. So, the, the, keep saying that an integer point isn't rounded to anything is something which, in mathematics, by thanks to Bourguin, you know, is, a, a, is actually something which hurts you sometimes. And I have not seen in algorithmic context rounding algorithms which allow you to change the integer points themselves. So, I, I will, so this is something which is a kind of something that I'm wondering about from the perspective of um, point of view of computer science. I can give decisive reasons why this is good in mathematics. Okay, but let, let, maybe I'm jumping too far, but I'm just maybe I know that the, uh, your computer scientist, so this is like a, something that would be happy to find applications for. Um, in, other than you know, algorithm context. Okay, so, but this is obvious, right? The, the randomized round problem, if you happen to be an integer point in our, our case, the A is the hairs on the audience's head, then you don't round to anything. You're the delta message yourself. And, um, and then for every two points X and Y in the ambient space, you look at um, mu X minus mu Y. I'll write the definition. You look at the transportation cost, the minimum weight, uh, the Wasserstein one metric, and the transportation cost distance between them. And you want this to be less than L times the distance. So this double W1, if you have mu and u, um, if mu and u are probability measures, A, a, a in this case, okay. um, then uh, then you look at then then you look at all and pi. So this is the space of all couplings. This is all uh, all the. This is all. So this is means that when I write this, I mean that pi is a probability measure on x times x, and the integral of f x d pi x y is the integral of f of y d mu y. This is the marginal. This is for every f, okay? every not measurable f. So the marginal of this coupling, if you integrate with y, it's the same as it's, it's just a measure new, and that is a bit. F of x, d, f of y, d pi, x, y. So what uh, yeah, yeah. is the integral of f of x, d u of x? So, okay. That's what the coupling is. So, it is, uh, and then the faster than one distance. of the integral of the distance that's the y d pi. This was saying that this is small, it says that there is a way to match a point in the support of mu to a point, at least fractionally match, a point in the support of mu to a point in the support of mu, such that the average, after you did this random this matching, the average displacement in the in the given metric is small. However, that was small. It was. I mean, I'm, 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 this is. I hope I'm not saying something which uh, you haven't seen. But please stop me because I'm. Happy. Okay. So. Okay. So. So the condition, the consistency condition here says that every point in this room is assigns to itself a point and, and of one uh, this a random notion of what is a random here in the audience. Such that if x and y are close, these distributions are allowed to be different, but they're but they but they don't dis, there is a way to match them to each other in such a way that the average displaced distance is close. I come close, but if they're very, very close, then um, okay, so is that clear? And that's a very natural rounding question. And so the smallest L is E of X. Uh, sorry. I, I, I should have said it then. Um, 
I could have just defined E of X, but I could have defined E of X in A if I didn't want to quantify every or every subset. I could have fixed the subset and say, I only care about the hairs on your head or, or um, Z to the N, for example. The perfectly legitimate question. Um, the integer points in our N, you want to round the point, on, that's what rounding is in, con in a continuous space to an integer point. So I mean, I didn't write this. So E of X of A just means the smallest concentrate for every Banach space, every one if it's function from the subset. Now we fix the subset A into the Banach space Y. You can extend this one liquids function to an L liquids function. So our previous E of X was just a super move reduce over all subsets A. Okay, so here I, I really refined it in, in terms of the A, which is perfectly legitimate and done in the literature. Um, so, the, so then you can ask what is the smallest L? Um, so with an asterisk, and it's, the, it's this E of X, right? not quite, and I, I, that's actually a big subtlety with, which gives a lot of headache. So first of all, how can you extend functions if you had this randomized rounding? Do you see that's, if you had the function F from A to a one space Y, what would you do? You might have, I want to now to extend it to a point outside. Yeah, so I take U, U, X has a mu of sub X, chooses a point in the little a in A. So I can take this sample, sample point, plug it into the given function, and integrate. And this is an F, right? This, this makes sense, this is well defined. And you can check that this is ellipses if the original thing was, was ellipses. And the fact that this was a delta mass at A is precisely saying it's an extension. Sorry, if X was in A, this is a delta mass at X, this is the same as saying it's an extension. Right? So it's obvious that, the, that the, I mean, this, you want something like this, is great. Now, there's a converse. I, the, the, there is this, it cannot be the way I wrote it. I don't know if anybody sees what's special about this extension formula, which doesn't fit. In so F capital F is an capital F is an extension is an L Lipschitz extension. That's always true. Um, does anybody see why this is not the general formula formulation of the problem? There's something special about this capital F which wasn't in the definition. that takes values in the convex hall as well. Actually, the closure. Uh, this, is a, okay. but this is not, I, 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 want, I didn't require in my definition capital F to remain in the convex hall. I want to, uh, maybe in a sooner prove Kirschmann's theorem. There are many situations where a lot of situations in the, in the literature where things are proved by duality, separate, we will see where you know that the values are in the convex hall. Okay, but, in, but this is not the same thing. And actually there are, again, you can look in the paper, there are proofs that separate between the two things. Okay, um, so, so in order to, so this is, this, is more, this is a better extension phenomenon. If you had these uh, randomized rounding issues, it's a better, you get something a little better. You, the guarantee is not that capital F takes values in the same target space Y, whatever that was. It's actually remaining in the convex hall of the, where the vertices are just the images of the, uh, of the hairs in your head. Or, okay, so this is not the same thing. In order for this to be the same thing, you study a very beautiful and delicate object called, what's called the free space. This is a topic of, again, a semester course, much more than a semester, There's a, uh, but, but so what you do, so um, you, what you do is you do a version of this phenomenon, but you need to drop that this is a probability measure because you want to leave the convex hall. Okay, so what you do is you look at um, all the measures, I'm going to go fast. There are lots of subtleties here that I'm just ignoring, and you can, but it's in the, in the, in the literature. And everything, it's not, I mean, not ignoring them in real life, I'm ignoring them only in the talk. Okay, um, so look at all the measures on A, 
for real measures of finite first moment, you know, um, uh, of total mass zero. Total mass zero. So there's sign measures. So, so there are all the measures, mu measures, u and a, which have total mass zero. So every measure can be written like this mu is mu plus minus mu minus, where these are honest positive measures. It's the same as saying that mu plus of a has the same, mu plus and mu minus have the same total mass. Okay, so when you look at that space of measures, there's also this requirement that um, they're a finite first moment. So from the distance from x to x zero, be, let's say mu plus x is finite for some, hence for every x zero, et cetera. And there are issues. And let me not be, so this is this is a, a space of measures which is a linear space now. They're not, they're not, it's not a, a probability measures. And it has a natural norm on it. Um, you can define the norm of mu in this free space. It's the Wasserstein one did it. So you, know, you look at the u plus minus mu minus in Wasserstein one. You cannot do a coupling of two measures unless they have, that's why you need total mass zero. There is, this doesn't make any, you could, this doesn't make any sense unless they have the, the same total mass. But the minute you insist in that they have the same total mass, first of all, it's a linear space, the sum of any two have this property. And you can look at the best way to transport the positive part to the negative part. Is that clear? And, the, um, and then the free space is really the closure of this space under this topology. And it's very annoying, not annoying, it's interesting. The closure doesn't have to, elements in the closure are no longer measures, even when A is, let's say, the integers inside R. So in the closure, there are all kinds of objects which are not measures, but, um, um, but we, we understand this, okay? So we have to leave the space of measures, but, and then you can do the same thing, but instead of probability measures, Ux is just an element of this free space. Okay. Okay, now this doesn't make sense because it total mass zero. So I fixed some points. It doesn't matter for the proof. Some x zero in it. Fix. Okay. So you now this is total mass zero. And now this has a meaning, right? Mu x minus mu y is yet another measure of total mass zero. So you can look at mu x minus mu y plus, that's complicated. And you will try to transport it to mu x minus mu y minus. And then you have this condition. And then the formula will be the same, except that plus f of x zero, right? So in order for it to be an extension, because at, at the point in A. And that now this, this is just a shift, right? You subtract to these cancels, and you can repeat the proof. The, the checking of this. And now this is an honest reformulation of the problem. Okay, so I will lay, uh, so whenever I write lower bounds, I actually write prove lower bounds against arbitrary sign measures in this sense, or even elements in the closure, but that's not a big deal. Okay. okay. Um, okay so this is, this is not, this is exactly the same question. But I think the convex hull, obviously, at least from the point of view of algorithms, the version with probability measures is fascinating, but also it's interesting in the context of extension of Lipschitz functions, insisting that you somehow didn't leave the convex hull. You somehow you went somewhere else. Okay, but uh, so but but now I'm not hiding anything. Is that clear? This is a natural object that this, uh, and that's how to turn everything into a Banach space. Okay, but now you see how to prove the duality that the two things are the same. What do you do? So if there is such a collection of rounding schemes, if there is such a rounding scheme, then he, I wrote you the formula of the extension. Conversely, if there is an extension, how do you get a rounding scheme? You take the space Y to be this monster, the free space over A, and you look at the mapping, which assigns to every X in A, the, the delta mass of X shifted to make a total mass zero. This is a one Lipschitz function that it means that we transport a, single, a delta, two delta masses to each other. The best way to do it is just their distance. 
And the extension, the, the, the image of the extension will be what, whatever mu x is. So this is an easy duality once you, once you formulate it correctly. This is the same, it's a specific space, which is just one example gives you the rounding scheme. And if you have a rounding scheme, you integrate. Okay, so I think you see the proof, right? The question is how to use this duality and then, um, we're still in the infancy, but there is a problem, so. I'm gonna say a few words of results from it. There is a lot, um, there's a paper that I'm writing now. It's done, the math is done, it's about the um, stream by, okay, but uh, with Mark Braverman from here, where we approach this problem through the dual and solve all, all kinds of questions. It's not the first time that the dual was used, but this is systematic. Okay, and so I'll, I'll present some results. This is look out for it if you're interested of, of how we prove lower bounds and upper bounds by looking at the dual. In, in, I, as I said, it's not the first time this appeared occasionally that we worked with the measures, but this is kind of Wasserstein rounding um, focused on it, you know, like so. Uh, and, and this is it's something which um, I'm very pleased by it because it's, you know, usually, usually in mathematics we try to solve problems. Um, but this was an example where there was a dual version that was staring us in the face for a long time and I just didn't use it. You know, I knew the dual, but it's not being used. So the, the, main, the, the main reason why I like it is because I'm using something that I knew was there all along. Um, um, so that's a topic for a talk with a lot of details because it's about how we use it rather than there are theorems, there are some problems, but it's only it's about the proofs really. Okay. Um, okay, so that's like a commercial. Um, um, I want to um, so let so first of all, let me just tell you for just example how the things what the, the things end up looking like. Okay, when you look at things in the dual, and the dual allow leads to different proofs also. So it's not completely fair to say that it's so for example, remember you wrote this theorem J L S, which said that A E X is less than log N on X N points. We know log N over log. So if you think about the proof and realize that you want to think about the dual, this is in so this is Mendel and myself. I can tell you what the rounding scheme is. It's gonna be it's it's a so right, you, you had, right, X was now sitting in some super space Z. Remember this for the AE problem. So for every point in Z, call it Z in Z. Uh, so if Z is in X, I already know. Uh, it's gonna be without, this will give the extension into the convex file. So it will not be the, the shifted version. It will really be honest probability measures. Okay, so, so I already know that it has to be the delta mass. So if Z, is in the subspace X, it's a delta mass. And I can tell you what happens outside. So, so it's uh, what, what you do is you take some P bigger than one that you optimize over, and you just take mu Z of X is the distance one over the distance from Z to X. X is a point in the subset, right? To the power P. And then you normalize to make it a probability measure. So sum x x x is n points. This is a finite sum. Okay, so this is a probability measure on the subset x. X is a subset of a superspace. This is it depends on the point z. Okay. And it does something nice, actually. It's, it's, so the point Z, so looking at the hairs on the, on the audience, it, if there's a hair very, very nearby, then it gives a huge weight to that. It doesn't choose only that hair, it uses all of them, but it gives a huge weight to it, okay? Is that clear? So this is a nice kind of a measure, and then you optimize over PP, it ends up to be order log in uh, to give this theorem, and it's a computation. But when you think about the dual, this is what this is. And it's a, 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 um, a nice way to go, right? Um, if, if he is an X, the left. If X, X, yeah, I got confused by that. Okay. 
Okay, so this is what happens when you think about the dual. Um, if you want the login over log login, So, okay, so as I said, this comes from the original proof of Johnson intersection that you will see there is also power P of distances. It's just not what they did. This is, we, 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 after we realized the dual, we just said, okay, let's think about it. And this is okay, but this is really just digesting. Okay. Um, If you want to get the best known bound, which is this login over log login, I wrote it down. So you do the same thing, u, z, x. There is a normalization factor, which I don't remember what it is. N is the number of points. And now we do something more sophisticated. And again, it came from understanding the proof, but this is really also changing the proof. So once in the dual, told us what is the nicer way to do it. It's it, sometimes when you think about the dual, you end up changing the proof because um, you just, you realize what should be done. Okay, that's not a, um, so, it, so what you do is you, um, you look at how many points there are in the ball around X, sorry, around uh, Z of radius R inside of this given subset. Uh, Okay, so, all right, so what was the picture? What's X was sitting in some superspace Z, and there was a point Z here. So I draw a ball of radius R, and I look how many points are in the intersection. I integrate this the R over R. This is what always to make it every scale gets the same amount of um, weight. This is a lot of you know. And you have to make sense of this, so you you integrate this from the distance from z to x, the minimum of this is alpha times the distance from z to all the space x, to alpha times the distance. So I, I want this intersection up here to, I'm not, I don't want to be dividing by zero. Okay, so, um, there is this, this one point inside. If, if, and then alpha is a big number, and the optimum alpha is, I think, log in. I'm lying, I think log in over e to the root log login or something like that. But the, so what we're doing is we're taking z, this is x. I look at the nearest point, but I take a bigger ball, and I, I do this counting. So these balls have a, they bite a substantial chunk of the subset, and you integrate just this count one over the count instead of distances, the r over r. So this is what comes with, and then you need to compute, and this when you analyze this it becomes log over log, and just in that that's an exercise. Yeah. But that is the rounding argument that gives the best known bound for this AE. Okay, um, this is just a, what happens when you look at the dual. Um, shouldn't have erased. I want to say, um, um, so I want to say one word, just a nod, there's a whole topic to Bourguin's almost extension problem. Seven. This was in order to prove a theorem. I might say a word, but um, but I think in addition to the fact that there was a lot of nice mathematics in proving the theorem, including I, I think this, there is some methods that were again used afterwards decisively in many areas. I think it's the first time we introduced one of those methods. Just a mere question: the realization of this quote that you can that this even helps. It doesn't seem like it should help, um, but it does. So there's an obvious version of the Lipschitz extension problem. Let's start. So. So let's deal. So X is a balance, is a, let's say, n dimensional norm space. Y is any balance space. And 
let's just take a to be an epsilon net unit sphere. It's, it's a finite dimensional space. So extending from nets a lot, there is a, this is really a useful thing. So this is very, very often in applications, you have something which is the final discrete subset and you want to extend from a net. So you have the sphere, epsilon net, the one if its function is defined on the epsilon net and you want to make, so it's, it's a discrete set and you want to make sense um, of, it's a restriction of something on, on, on the continuous object, the entire sphere. Right. And, and this is exactly the situation where the retraction portion doesn't make any sense because, of course, you cannot retract them from the con connected sphere into a discrete subset. The retraction happens in the sense of this randomized rounding. That's what, right. Okay. Um, and then what he, th then his goal was um, so and for the extension problem, right, we wanted to find, so we had F from the net, which is one digit. Right. And we wanted to find f from the entire space x, which is f digits and extends f, extends u. Right, that was the goal. So the smallest l that you can get, this is this related to this e of x in the in the in the examples many times. It's a counter example is a net. Um, is that is a y, right? Uh, what are you pointing at? Is that is f h of y, right? Well, I don't see a y. That's small f. A two. The one lip is f. One lip. Is f oh. <laughs> this <is> y, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is, this, things are invisible when you're on the board. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay, so we know that this is the this is the vanilla version of extension. Okay, and then and um, L has to go to infinity. And this is what I did. the fourth root of an example for the Euclidean ball is that is an epsilon and the sphere. Okay, so you're stuck with an error, even though you started with the one if it's function defined in the net. If you want to extend it to the continuous world to the whole space, you have to get Lipschitz constant going to infinity. I didn't even say why we care about extension. So this has been studied for hundred years because it's interesting geometrically, but this is really a workhorse in, in analysis and geometry and, and combinatorics, et cetera. So it's just completely standard that we have a function which is defined in a subset, which is discrete and we want to analyze it. So we really would like to differentiate it, to convolve it with something, to look at its Fourier transform. What does that even mean, right? Okay, um, so, so there are many, many situations of this type where just the extension is allowed, allowing us to, to, feel, to do things, okay? There are many, many other reasons whether there's extensions are using approximation theory and there are all kinds of very um, subtle applications. There's, I, if you want to see a nice application to graph specification, look, there's a paper of Makarichev and Makarichev where they use extension to, they show that extension is equivalent to a specification problem. Etc. And there are more examples of this stuff. There's something called the zero extension problem, which is clustering. There are all kinds of issues in clustering. I will not get, there's a lot about connections between this and clustering. So there, there are sometimes non-obvious applications. But the obvious ones are, you want, you, we have tools in our hand, right? We, want, we have Fourier transforms, we have heat flow, we have semi group, we have convolutions, we have, we can differentiate, we want to get to work. If the function is defined on the net, what do we do, okay? That's the kind of the the, the non the, the obvious reason why. So there, there are you, one of the if you look at papers that use Lipschitz extension, there often there is a, a Lipschitz extension lemma somewhere in the guts of the paper, and that's not and this happens appears a lot for these reasons. Okay, um, so in the application that we're going to have in mind, losing any function going to infinity. Destroy it completely. Just let do nothing. I, 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 I might explain this application later. I don't want to waste time. Right? But it was it was a killer. Okay. If this were anything going to infinity, it would destroy the application. It was some infinite dimensional statement where you look at finite dimensional spaces. You wanted to get a linear mapping, so you wanted to extend the function, then differentiate it. 
that if the, and then you have to bound its norm, the norm is related to the Lipschitz constant. If the Lipschitz constant is going to infinity, this doesn't make, make any sense in the context of infinite dimensional spaces, and you can go home and, and you failed. Okay, so um, so this was an example where I've been, many times I'm, I'm, I'm happy when you get a small number there. This was in a situation where just there was nothing to talk about. Okay, just killed the application. So we again said, uh, okay, so let's look at the approximate version. So instead of demanding that F is an application, let's demand now something else. Let's demand that F is to go in Burgen's variation. Demand that F is big O of one digit. That's impossible in general. But relax that it's an extension. That's one and two. Um, now you want that the um, f of x minus little f of x, sorry, it's what's called y, is less than some k. E epsilon is the scale of the problem. You have to normalize by epsilon. If you don't want to work on the sphere, you take epsilon at one net in the entire space. It's essentially equivalent, then you don't have the epsilon. But this is the right normalization. And hopefully k is small. So when you do that, the capital F is big O one if you can look at its derivatives, they become bounded operators. Okay. They are not identical with your little f on the net, but they're very, when epsilon is tiny, they're still very, very close to it. And that's good enough for this application. So that's saved it and with nice mathematics, but I think just the, the mere idea is kind of obvious when you think about it. Okay. Um, so this is something which is good in mathematics. I would love to see application in computer science. Okay, so what, what, what's the, the dual formulation which I erase is the same thing. At every point in X chooses a probability distribution over the subspace, the subset, such that the, the, the measure correspond, not or probability or an element of the free space. Uh, it depends if you insist that capital F takes values into convex hall or not. But uh, um, Time. Then you want the faster shine distance between New York and New York is less than k time, uh, sorry, the big O of one here, of one of the distance from x and y. But the fact that it was before we wanted capital F of x to be the delta mass at x, you just want the faster shine distance between mu of x and the delta mass at x to be small. How much k times epsilon? Okay, so effectively, if you think of a as the integer points, what you're seeing is a rounding scheme, which takes a point outside to an integer point, but allows the integer point itself to change. I'm, 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 yeah, you understand why I'm, why I'm intrigued by the potential. Um, I, don't, I don't have more to say, but I, I just, so I should, should just say that then, and then I, then I five minutes and I'll... So we're again proved that, this is Burgen's, the theorem of Burgen from the same paper. Prove that you can do this with possible if k is big of n. n is a dimension of the, the SpaceX. So remember, before L was the Lipschitz constant was big of n. Now we insist that the Lipschitz constant is 100, let's say. And then the error is n times epsilon in the extension. Okay, so it looks like it's the same n, and I, I, so in 2021, it's an, um, I proved that they, um, this is needed. So Bruggen's theorem is, is sharp, so uh, cannot do better in this statement. Cannot do better than um, n to the one minus the low one. N over e to the root log n or something. Um, in the forthcoming work, one of the, with Mark Braverman, um, by look, understanding the dual and seeing what happens in the dual, we actually get the engine, the low one chart, but this is not published yet. So, and, okay, so but that's one of the corollaries of why it's helpful to look at the dual. So I know that this is not so. This is, will be out soon. Um, Three is that um, the same thing cannot be better than 
Okay, so Boolean is short um, for this. Um, so unlike the Lipschitz extension problem, which I do not know when you insist an extension, what is the Lipschitz constant in the approximate version, the game is understood. Um, so, um, and, but, okay, this is a beautiful topic, but the application is for etc. cetera. Um, yeah, this, is, this is available. This Wasserstein rounding problem is interesting in its own right. And, um, and it's been, I explained to you, I think it's, it's kind of obvious when you think about it, why it potentially could be useful in analysis. Why, can, why are we not using it for algorithms? Maybe there is a reason. Okay. Do you get more application should this yes in this, in this paper to bring No. 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 I just get we're getting something. I, I do the paper with Mark Roverman, I, I I the reason so I like talking, he's a brilliant guy and I like talking with him. But the reason it was I started talking with him is because I was hoping that it would lead to a TCS paper, but it ended up a math paper. <laughs> but, you know, I think my hope was actually not. I'm very very happy, but uh, you know, uh, it did not end up a TCS paper. Um, okay, so yeah, three minutes. Um, So out of the 90% of, of the topics I plan, I have to choose what to show you. Um, let me show you. Do you want some like classic, some classic proofs of some more classic theorems rather than new results? Or, or let me just, uh, yeah, there's no way to talk about everything. So uh, um, you know where to find me um, if you want to hear more. Um, um, yeah, so I, I, yeah, okay. in the paper with Robert, there are all kinds of things like there. I'm not saying it's massively important, but this is something that I've been wondering about for many, many years. You can ask what happens when A, when R ends has a Euclidean norm and the subset is just the integers. This is genuine rounding in the sense of round, rounding like of classical number theory, right? Uh, so you, you take a point in Rn, it has to, you have to assign to it a uniform, a probability measure over integer points. Okay, so you can ask what is the smallest L, which is the same thing as extending from the integer. So, I, so in the dual, and that's subtle, that's, and that's a specific example. Here. When you really, really have to optimize, it turns out upper and lower bounds of the universal constant, the answer is n to the one over six. So you can know, <laughs> so the extension problem from the, the z to the n to L to n, the answer is n to the one over six. And it, you, we do it in the dual, but, uh, okay, so there, there are all kinds of things like that. Uh, that we can do, but let me go. Uh, that, that's one example, but there are some, there are more general theorems there that they. Uh, um, but yeah, okay. Um, but I think that's kind of classical, feels like number theory. But uh, it's uh, maybe it has some use for something. Um, okay, so. The, Okay, um, let me just say, I, I want to end up with another open question, which I think should be solved. So I, can I take five minutes over or? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, but feel free to stop me because I, I'll never stop. Okay. But, um, <laughs> that's, that's what happens when you like, that's what happens when you like something. So it's like, um, um, okay. Um, okay, so there was this extension problem and I, I immediately jumped to bounding this constant. But, uh, and, and uh, as we, but there is the classically, and I mentioned the Hanbanach theorem in the beginning, there are many situations, not many, but it, we're used to the fact that you can extend to a function which is exactly the same Lipschitz constant. Okay, so um, this is the classical situation. Uh, now, when you want to, when you're not about losing factor 100 or log n over log, log n, et cetera, then there is something else that you can, at your disposal. Okay, so suppose, it's, not, it's usually impossible. Suppose you're hoping to prove a theorem where every Lipschitz function on the subset can be extended to a Lipschitz function in the global space and the Lipschitz constant did not change at all. Okay, so there's one thing that you can do in this case, which you cannot do in any of the other cases that they said be up to now, or in any other case, which is in this particular case, you can do it by induction. You can just prove that you can extend to one more point, one addition, or you can always extend to one additional point because you're not losing in any iteration, okay? Right, so, or for infinite spaces, it's Zorn's lemma. The, the, the maximal extension 
if you could prove this going to always extend to one more point, the maximal extension will be to the entire space. Okay, so, but that's very, very special. You cannot, uh, okay, but this is actually leads us to uh, a, a, 19, a, a theorem of Kirchbaum that I want to explain, uh, the, the, the 1934, which is a very, it's really very nice duality of semi different programming, very early, became, if you can interpret it this way. So, so let me just, uh, I, I want to show an example of a proof, which is from 1934. Okay, so, um, and that's, and that, it, it's like, it's, it feels like TCS, except it's much older. And then I want to ask an open question related to it. Okay, so that's where I end. So this is not my work. It's a, we're back to the 1930s. Um, so there is, so there is a, so for, so, so this is what I call isometric extension. Isometric extension is when the rare situation where you can extend and you lose nothing. The Lipschitz constant remains the same. That's what I think. So there's a criterion. Which appears in the book of I've seen it for maybe in some paper before of Wells and Williams. There's a book from 1975 by Wells and Williams called Embeddings and Extensions in Analysis. And the, 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 the old theory was all about not losing a constant, it was very isometric. Um, and there is a whole theory there, and great mathematicians worked on it. And this book, what it is about. So there's a criterion. Um, which is really just understanding Kirschbaum's work. So the, the key person here is Kirschbaum. And for example, Kirschbaum's theorem appears in TCS papers as lemmas multiple times. So um, that's a, I, I will get it. I'll tell you what the theorem means. But, yeah. um, but the criterion, so, so th this is their terminology. I'm not saying, I, so, so we have two metric spaces, X, the x and y, the y are metric spaces. We say that they, they satisfy proper decay, or they have proper decay. K for Kirchbaum. That's, this is their terminology. Um, it's the following geometric statement also. So, so you take any collection of points, x, i, infinite or finite, indexed by some set, and x, um, y, i, and y, and you have some numbers, r, i, zero, again, indexed by the same thing, and, um, And what you know is that the configuration of the y's is, a, is all the distances are closer than the configuration of the x's. So you know that the distance, um, I won't write subscripts x and y, it will be obvious. The distance between x i, between y i and y j is less than the distance from x to x j. Why is it just pushed to closer together version of the axis? Clear? Um, then the, the pair is probably the game. Whenever this happens, if you look at the balls, they're going to be always closed balls. So the balls around xi over this ri, if all of them intersect, there's a point to come into all of them. And the same. So if there is a point in all these balls, then there's also in Y. So if this, if this happens for every such configuration, then the pair has proper decay. So again, I'm not going to write because I'm running out of time. The fact that have, being able to extend any Lipschitz function from any subset, any one Lipschitz function, from X to Y, now Y is not a norm space anymore, just a property of the pair. Um, Without losing anything in the Lipschitz constant, still to extend it to still a one function is equivalent to proper decay. So let's very quickly do it in our head why this is true. Um, so if you can extend, then 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 you then take the xi i and i. This is an arbitrary subset of x. 
okay? Um, and define why I to be the image of Xi under your given one Euclid function. Okay, now suppose there is a point here, look at the value of the extension at that point, some point in Y, right? That, that's what an extension means. And, and, and just check that this, because of the Lipschitz, the one Lipschitz condition, uh, this point is the intersection of the bound. Conversely, um, if you take the x size and you want and, and you want to extend, I want to. Well, we already said it's enough to prove it to extend to one more point because then you iterate to another point and another point. Take a maximal extension. So you will take x. So take these x size and then take any point which isn't. And so this point is in the intersection of the ball around x i of radius r i, which is the distance from x to x i. Okay. So there is a by the geometric criterion, there is a point in this intersection. Define it to be the point of the image of x and check that this is one digit still. Okay, so that's the geometric interpretation of extension. When you lose nothing, it's the same thing. Okay. So now let's say, uh, okay, I'm five minutes over time. Can I take three more minutes? Or... You, you can go up. <laughs> go up. Uh, what? Stop, stop when it's natural. <laughs> okay, I told you I'll never stop. This is the kind of, what I'm doing now is being to take the gym, right, of course, but uh, it's okay. But, uh, so let's just warm up. So let's prove the nonlinear Hanbana theorem. Which says that you can always extend a one Lipschitz function to the real line from any subset of metric space to one Lipschitz function everywhere. So let's just check the criterion. Okay, so, so this is x is general, and y is r. Okay, so, so what we, so we have, we, we now let's just write the, we know that yi minus yj, these are numbers now, are less than the distance from xi to xj. And, um, and we know that this intersection of the balls is not empty. Strictly the, 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 this proper decay. And um, this is very easy. You don't need to do this for your, in, in this particular case, it also for closed for formulas for the extension. I mean, this is overkill, but um, okay. Um, okay. Um, so where was, so, so I want to find a point Y, which is in all the balls, the balls are intervals in the real line. So we want a point which is Y is less than Y I plus R I, and at least Y I minus, minus R I for every I. I just wrote down the two, sorry, the real line. Okay, so this is, so this is the same as saying that the supremum of Y I minus R I is less than the infimum Y I plus R I. Right, this is, that's exactly what's written here. Okay, so what I need to do is now I need to take I and J. I'm doing different things throughout. Then I want to show that Y I minus R I is less than Y J plus R J. I'm just rewriting, I'm just writing, why is that so? Because I mean, it's, at some point, it is a triangle inequality. Right? So this is the same thing as saying that y i minus y j is the same r i plus r j. Okay, but the only information that we have is that this is less than the distance from x i. And we know that the ball of radius r i around x i intersects the ball of radius. They intersect. So whatever point is here, do the triangle point from here to here, and you get that indeed that this is at most. Okay, so we check the one one thing. 
for example. Um, I plan to do five examples or so of something. Uh, let me jump to the main one. So this is useful. It's actually very easy to check in all kinds of ways. So let me show you what Kirchhoff did in 1934, which is not really nice in my opinion. Um, so Kirchhoff's theorem, just application of the criterion. Various extensions in the literature, generalizations. All it says is that if X and Y are Hilbert spaces, and they have this property K, then they have K. So in other words, any any Lipschitz function from an arbitrary crazy subset of a Hilbert space to a Hilbert space can be extended to a, if it was one Lipschitz, the extension is also one Lipschitz. Okay, let's check the criterion. Okay, um, so, so you have this xi i i, i i in i. Um, I, I want to first reduce it to finite dimension. So this in first, which is anyway what we care about. But uh, so we have this information. So if this were a priori in infinite set in infinite dimensions, balls in a Hilbert space are what's weakly compact. So they have the finite intersection property. If every finitely many of the balls intersect, then all of them intersect. In the end, I want to show this for the yi. They're lying in a Hilbert space. These are weakly compact in any topology, but in particular, weak topology then it's enough to deal with finitely many points. If I find a point in, in the intersection of every finitely many of the YIs, I find none of them. Okay, so, so, it's, so it's enough to, so, so we, it's enough to deal with X1 up to Xn. That's it. Moreover, we can assume now, now that X and Y are, 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 are N. Again, I'm using the fact that it's a norm one projection. So, they could be lying in some bigger dimensional space, but they can look at the Hilbert space, which is the span of X1 up to Xn. And um, there is a point in the intersection of these balls, a priori it's outside, no, but if I project it onto the span, it's, the distance has only got smaller. So there's also a point in the intersection of the balls within the span. And then, so that's why it's enough to deal with RN. So it's really a question about RN, okay? I said quickly, but I <laughs> So this is what, so really this is the question about our N and this is a, um, okay. So, um, okay. I have many, many, many applications of this show. Okay. So, so now we take, um, um, so, so, take, so, so take this point X that is given to us. That's what we know is given to us, okay. And we, again, the easy case is when the x is one of the xi's. Then you take the corresponding yi. So we can assume this is the interesting case. In the extension context is the case when you want to extend to a point which is already in the set. Okay, but we can assume that x is not there. Okay, and then define the function h from r a by h of y is the maximum. I goes from one to n of the distance from y to y i. This is in L2, this is uh, end ratio of x to x. The, the denominator is vanished, that's why I, I wrote this. And then, and the, um, so this function, it's obviously continuous, it's a maximum of n terms. And it also tends to infinity at infinity. The, these are, the, um, the denominators are not dependent on y. So we detain this global minimum by compactness. So, so define, suppose that H of Y is the R So H of Y, so there exists Y in R N such that H of Y is M, which are defined to be the minimum of H of Z. The minimum is a thing. Okay, so the question.
question is equivalent to saying we, we, the question is the goal. If you show the ends this one, and it works one, sorry. Right? Because take the y value, this is the, the same question. Because th then, then you get m at this y. If m is at most one, the distance from y to yi is at most the distance from x to xi, but the distance from x to xi is at most ri, so y is in the intersection of the balls. I, I just rewrote everything. Everybody agrees? So we are, okay, so, um, so okay, so, um, so this is just a rewriting of everything. So define j to be the set of indices, such that there is equality. It, it, at least in one point, this equals m. This is a maximum in terms, at least once it equals m. So, so this is the set of points where y minus y is m. Okay. There is one, that's a definition. Uh, so by definition, we know that this three, there is y i y minus y i is strictly less than m x minus x i where i i that's it again everything is by definition so we claim that this y the argument must be in the convex hull of um, the y j when j is just for the maximum of the thing. Geometrically, you look at this convex hall, these are the vertices of this, whatever this polytope is, are where there is equality. Call this at K. So, so we suppose for contradiction why is not there. So there's a separating hyperplane. And we can look at the direction perpendicular. Here we're using Hilbert space already. The direction perpendicular to this hyperplane and move y epsilon towards the set. So because it's going in the perpendicular direction, the distance from y to yi, all of these distances for the vertices of the set became smaller. And a head slack for the rest. So this is a different, this can predict this is the global minimum. I'm doing it fast, but I. Clear? All right, so this is so we prove that y is the sum lambda j yj. Um, j is set, whatever the set was, the vertices of the polygon, where lambda j are convex of lambda j. So now I do a problem. So now I'm going to uh, choose an index. I'm going to do a probabilistic argument. I'm going to, so let's say a random index. So let's I be a random element of these numbers of J, the BT of I equals J is lambda J. So that when we think of this as a random weight of, 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 of a random variable, and we use this uh, geometry just to prove that it exists. So now um, we know that the expectation of Y i, i is the, the index of the randomness is y. That's a different way of writing the same thing. And now um, let's compute the expectation of y i minus the expectation of y i, which is y squared. So this is the sum j and j. Y j minus y. What are these numbers? All of them are m. That's the definition of the set capital J. Hope it's 
is the approximate of the equality in the definition of H. So what's written here is M squared, M squared. And M squared because you're sorry, sorry, sorry. There's equality, each of these numbers is M times XJ minus X and then squared. So M squared times the expectation of XI minus X. Okay. You can change the y's to the right. Okay, that's what's written there. Now, this is again a property of Hilbert space that that. Um, the, the, the point with the definition of expectation, the variation of definition of expectation, is the point which minimizes the squared distance to the mean. To, to the mean, the mean is the point that minimizes the squared distance to any other point. Is at least expectation x i minus expectation of x i. This is just you just expand it out and it's a quadratic function and you just check. If you haven't seen this about a Hilbert space, then. Okay, that, but I'm using Hilbert space in many, many places. Um, okay, and um, and again, again, more properties of Hilbert space on this. This is the same as the expectation of the distance between x i and x i prime, where i prime is just an independent copy, and there's a half. I didn't write the half in my note, but there's a half. So if you extend this, the, the variance is the expectation of the random variable minus the length of the expectation squared. And if you do two independent copies, then I, uh, my notes in separate. Okay, never mind. And, um, and um, this is at least m squared over 2, the expectation of y i minus y. That is the assumption that the y's are contractions. Contraction for the, all the pairwise distances, which is again m squared, the expectation of y i minus expectation of y i. Target is also a Hilbert space. The is most one because they can, right? Because they started with this. I think it's a very, very nice proof um, from the 1930s. Um, fun to show. Um, okay, so one thing that they, okay, um, let me, I'm gonna, okay, so I wanna, there, there is a question which I think should be solved. Each time I, actually when I prepared this yesterday, I ended up thinking all night about trying to solve it again. It feels like it should be solved. So, so there is a very, there is a, so I wanted to say a question which feels to me like we're on the cusp, okay? Um, so um, so there, is a, there is a theorem which is just follows from what we did. But, um, it's called Minty's theorem. 1970, which says that in, if instead of Lipschitz you look at Helder functions, it's the same. So, um, so you can always extend Helder function. So, x d is a metric space. Why is it going to be a Hilbert space? So you have a is a subset of x. X is a completely general metric space. F from A well to any of which space A M is one one half other one. So if I, I mean F X minus one. So the square root of the distance from X to Y for the X and Y, then it can be extended. Then there is a capital 
this one will throw your pots of water. And, and um, extensive. It's, a use, it's completely new, full generality. Um, ex helder extension is just a special case of Lipschitz extension because it's the same as uh, being one half helder with constant one is the same as being one Lipschitz with respect to this metric space. It's really the previous case. So in all the criteria, there is a version for helder because uh, it's the same. It's really just the same thing. Um, so, so this is a corridor of this. Uh, I can tell you what the ball in the in the criterion. So we uh, just check that the, 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 you you look at L two of X. You want I want to use the Kirchhoff thing. So you look at the Hilbert space, which is little L two of X. So it's just all the the, the, the formal sums: some A I E, some A X, E X, X and X, such as some A X squared five. The, 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 if you have a del the delta mass at every point is a, a it's this one's called little delta two, the standard Gilbert space. And um, of course, this means that the sum is the only countable in the element, otherwise, you can convert. Okay, so, um, so then in L2 of X, you look at the ball. Of radius root IRI against, sorry, root R, yeah, root RI XI with radius root R. So this is in L of X. So I claim that the intersection I and I, I'm, I'm looking at the criterion, a collection of points XI, I and I, such as the intersection of the XIs. The balls around X has a radius RI is not empty, and I want to deduce this for the Ys. So I'm going to, I'm looking at this. This isn't empty. Why? Right. The point zero in L2 of X is in, is in distance root or I from each of these, okay? Um, and now we, I, now, I, now, uh, now, we, now you check that uh, this collection of points, L2 of X and the YIs, which are in a Hilbert space, satisfy the, the, the assumptions. The, the contraction and the intersection is just checking. Therefore, by the case of Kirchhoff's theorem, which we already proved, this is in Hilbert space. There is a point in here, and then when you check what this means, this corresponds to one half helder. So I, 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 there is no, I'm not hiding any idea. I told you the trick was to find, the question is, where is the Hilbert space here? This is where the, the whole you get the Hilbert space. Okay, and, and, I, and I swear that I'm not finding a trick. Okay, that was a trick. Okay, so that gives the one half helder. So, um, so okay. So, I showed you two uses. So I gave you two examples of a situation where you can always extend. So one, of, so one of them is that E between any metric space and L infinity is one. I don't mean the infimum is one. Equally one. So you can always extend functions from a subset of a Hilbert space going into an infinity without losing any of the flip system. That's not a notation I introduced before. Forgive me, okay? Um, why is that? This is the same as nonlinear Hanbana, which we proved. I should have said it. When we proved nonlinear Hanbana, that was for function going, functions going into the real line. But it immediately implies the same extension criterion for functions going into an infinity, because what is a one Lipschitz function into an infinity? The normal infinity is the maximum of the coordinates. So being one Lipschitz is the same thing. Each of the coordinates, which are functions of the real line, are one Lipschitz. So you can extend them simultaneously. I should have said that. That's just an immediate corollary of the fact that that's what L infinity does. It reduces it to the real line. OK. So that's the linear Hanbana, which we proved using this intersection of all criterion with soup and inf. So it used order. So in particular, for every n, this is one that's n, n coordinates. Now we also know that e, let's call this x to the one half. So for one half, the, the x to the one half, x to the alpha is the metric 
Thanks for this metric. So this would mean this theorem. And the two n is also one. We just check this by this trick. So the question is, sorry. Yeah, okay. So from here, there's a trivial thing that they can do. And I can get this is less than n to the distance the by Lipschitz distance between Hilbert space and, and, and at infinity and its root of n. These are all by Lipschitz invariants. If you go so for at infinity it's one, but if you want into a Hilbert space, so now the question that Carlton asked, so the conjecture. Four is about how do we interpolate between these two facts from any metabolic of space I can send, extend from any metric space I can extend Lipschitz functions and lose a factor of root of n. Again, I said I go for certain infinity and then I change the metric root of it by losing the root n. And this is this is Kirschbaum Minty. This is this delicate, um, not delicate, but nice fact. Okay, so he conjectured that for every x. Alpha in between E X to the alpha, so we want to accept alpha Hilbert functions into a Hilbert space is less than N to the alpha minus a half. But right, so when alpha is a half, it's a constant and it's open. So the point is that it was twice in this application of this ball intersection criterion. But one of them uses the order soup and in for points in the real line, or the, each of the coordinates. The other one uses this uh, separation and, and this uh, Hilbert structure. And I do not see how to find the proof which, into, which somehow does both, which unifies these points of view, even though they're both applications of the same criteria. Okay, so I think that's a, and I, it's very tempting. So there's a paper, I have a paper with Urbani which discusses lower bounds. This has to go to infinity and alpha. Is between strictly between uh, between a half and one, um, but this is a very nice question with extensions from an arbitrary metric space into Rn. How to interpolate between two classical theorems, which use the same criterion, but the proof someone doesn't have. Can I, I do not see how to generalize them. There should be a way to generalize them, and we have these points of view today that maybe will uh, will will. So yeah, that's that's one, and then let me end with a. Uh, a big apology. I guess I'm not online anymore. So a big apology for everybody for enduring me for so long. Um, there is the Knezer Poulsen. Conjecture. Let me show you the subtlety of so we proved this here spot here. I don't know. Does anybody, does anybody ever hear of the Knezer Poulsen conjecture is from the early 50s? Tantalizing. Okay, so so what do we know? So when in our n we proved so you, so you have if you have m sorry x1 up to x n and y1 up to y n in our k let's say that was the okay so we know we already know oh, sorry such that we're given such collection of points such as the wiser contractions of the x sides such as y i minus y j is there no, no, nothing is uh, is less than x i that's what's given to us. Okay, then we know that intersection of the ball of Euclidean box of xi, ri, i equals to one, two. And if this is not empty, then this is something that we proved just now. Okay, so you have a collection of points. So the x's and the y's are correspondingly smaller. You draw the balls with the same radii, but now around the smaller configuration, then you also have a point. We proved that intuitively. So that's can you turn, is there a quantitative version of this? Can you say that the volume of this? No. A collection of spheres, including balls, pushed together, does the volume increase? 
if you push them together. They change the rate, they just push them together. So this is open, okay? Grom from 1987, then this is a pause. If this N is at most K or K plus one. I don't, maybe, okay. And since then people work, I think they're up to K plus two or K plus three. But even two K, two K points, twice the dimension is, up, is open. I think in, in R2, when K is two, it's known for arbitrary many points. So, even, so you see the minute you just change, uh, you have all kinds of very, very clean questions in geometry that they are open. And that was just a tiny, tiny taste of, of those. And I'm really, really, really sorry that they stop. Okay, I'll stop now. We'll take questions of village. Yeah, I mean, if there's any quick questions, perhaps. Uh, anyways, let's just thank him again. Thank you.